The delegates concluded their business on schedule today after hearing over 250 resolutions during this three-day meeting. Adopted as AEA policy are resolutions calling for reduced pupil-teacher ratio, more textbooks, a more equitable share of funding for kindergarten through 12th grade. The assembly first defeated a request for increased funding for vocational education, but after reconsideration, the measure passed. The assembly had no trouble passing a resolution calling for substantial salary increases for teachers or for one to bring the salaries up to the national average. Our cost of living is increasing at basically the same, uh, same rate as, as the nation as a whole. The average salary of teachers in Alabama is $12,000. The national average is over $14,000. AEA Executive Secretary Paul Hubbard says not all the programs will be funded by the legislature, but the AEA will work on priorities. What this policy-making body does is attempt to establish some priorities and attempt to say to us what we feel should be said to the legislature that's important when the legislature begins to consider funding. So while the statements are made as if the body wants them implemented in totality, they in fact do, but reality is there will not be the dollars there to implement every resolution, and the delegates know that. So what we will attempt to do is work with the governor and the legislature in terms of getting them to implement, to the extent possible within available dollars, the request of the governance body of the association. What do you think will be your priorities for funding? Well, obviously class size continues to be a problem. We still have too many teachers with too many students uh, in the classroom. Facilities continue to be a problem. Too many portable trailers and too many portable classrooms. And obviously inflation uh, impacting on salaries will be a problem. And uh, I'm, I know the legislature will want to look at a cost of living raise for teachers and other employees. The resolutions passed by this assembly will be studied by AEA staff and formulated into their legislative program. But with a new legislature and a new governor, only time will tell if AEA gets what they want. Glenda Webb, WSFA TV News at Montgomery Civic Center. The standoff between the city of Tuscaloosa's police department and the Tuscaloosa News began when, according to city officials, the police received numerous requests from some of the victims of alleged crimes to withhold their names from the public. The police originally had placed a total ban on access to its offense reports, but then lifted it and has made available to the public approved reports. Tuscaloosa Police Commissioner Dave Andrus says the department will release information it feels the public is entitled to receive. Newspapers no longer honor just our simple request on the offense report that was printed on it to not release certain information. Uh, the other news media had continued to honor our request and uh, of course we had a lot of complaints. We had to look and assess our situation. We got with our legal department to see what we could do to uh, uh, as far as we could protect the rights of our, uh, the victims of the crime, and this is the policy we arrived at. You are identifying the people, you are not identifying their, where they live, is that it basically? No, we're not identifying the uh, name of the victim, we're identifying the general location of where they live. We feel, of course, that any, anyone would like to know that if there's a rash or burglaries or robbers in a particular location, that they should know that. Ed Fowler, the managing editor for the Tuscaloosa News, who refused to appear on camera, said there is an important principle involved here in what the people have a right to know. Fowler, who has been managing editor for the News since early November, contends that information on crimes committed against the public is a legitimate concern to the people of Tuscaloosa, and that under the First Amendment, such information should be made available to the public. Fowler says the newspaper is entitled to use its editorial judgment when publishing stories and if information contained in the stories may be injurious to any police investigation. Fowler said there has been no great outpouring of complaints from the citizens on the newspaper's policy. The standoff remains just that, a standoff. The newspaper says it will continue to publish police blotter reports and it will also make note that such reports have been censored by the Tuscaloosa Police Department. The city says it stands on its policy of releasing information in its opinion the public is entitled to receive. Reporting from Tuscaloosa, George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. ASU blasted out to a 10 to nothing lead in the first half and capitalized on several central state mistakes to go on to the large margin of victory. Alabama State thus ends the 1978 season with a record of eight wins against three losses. 
Today's game was billed as the first Frank Bannister Classic. Bannister is a nationally known sportscaster and is sports director of the Mutual Black Network. Great, great honor. You know, it's something that uh, made me think. And uh, after I really did a little research on it, and some other people told me I'm the first time a football game has been named in honor of a person that's still living. And that was something that bothered me until I got here. I said, well, if I just make this first one. <laughs> Bannister is also a good friend of Muhammad Ali, who was supposed to have been in attendance at today's game, but apparently Ali didn't make it because of the bad weather. Bannister says, despite reports to the contrary, Ali is not going to retire. Ali is not going to retire because it's too much money in it. First of all, he's such a drawing card, and uh, I think we all could use another three or four or five or six million dollars to whatever we have. And uh, a title like this, Ali believes that he is bigger than boxing. He believes the title is not important so much as uh, that he's got to hold on to it. So he wants to, boxing is a business to Muhammad Ali now. It's no longer a sport to him, and he uses it that way, you know. So Ali will fight again. He's not going to retire. Alabama ranked in the top 20 in some preseason polls is not off to the fast start some expected. They're three and two, losing their opener to Wagner, a game in which they played poorly, and later to Michigan at Michigan. That, of course, is nothing to be ashamed of. The Wolverines are a top 10 team. With several days off now, Alabama hopes to work some of its talented freshmen into the offense more to take some of the heat off SEC Player of the Year Reginald King. Philip Lockett right now looks to be the newcomer that can give King some rest, and there are several others who have the potential to make Alabama a factor in the SEC. Well, to me, I think they are one of the best group of freshmen that's came through here in a long time. They look pretty good. They look real good. The SEC postseason tournament appears to work in favor of young teams such as Alabama. By tournament time, Alabama's talented freshmen should be seasoned enough to help. This is Phil Snow reporting. Yesterday, Commissioner Jim Ziegler called on the power company to give back money billed to some of its customers during the six-day period that higher rates were in effect last month. Ziegler has maintained that Alabama Power Company took advantage of some of its customers because it held back bills until the increase was granted. An official of Alabama Power Company in Montgomery, Bryant Allen, says they cannot honor Ziegler's request. There are charges that the, the bills were withheld to take advantage of the higher rates, the 25% rate surcharge? Uh, a lot of those charges started with Mr. Ziegler. And Mr. Ziegler issued the order, signed the order, in fact wrote the order. We complied with every aspect of that order perfectly legal. We did not bill any customer on Alabama Power Company system any bill that was not correct and ordered by the Public Service Commission. What would have been the case had there been uh, something other than an increase mandated or ordered by the PSC on November 22nd? That, that's a good question. Had that order said, and we had no idea what the order would say, had that order said that all customers would get a 25% rate reduction effective with bills due on November the 22nd, 
then the whole procedure would have been handled exactly the same way and the same account and the same customers would have had that reduction. In an effort to explain its side of the billing controversy, Alabama Power Company has purchased ads in many of the daily newspapers across the state. The cost of this explanation, according to Power Company officials, is about $7,300, and they say the consumer will not be footing the bill for the ads. Instead, the cost will be borne by the stockholders of Alabama Power Company. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Uh, approximately a year ago, uh, they petitioned the city council for to solicit here in the city, and uh, it, this petition was denied, and therefore they sued the city and went to federal court. And at that time, the federal court uh, threw our ordinance out. And uh, since then, we have no control over these people. Now, these shopping centers, uh, this is private property, and this goes back to the uh, uh, managers of the stores and the local owners to, to enforce this because it's private property. Major, is there anything that the individual can do to deter these people? Well, uh, the complainers tell us that these p people continually harass them at times that they will just give them money to get away from them. Now, these people, uh, when they do this, if they'll give us a call, uh, they can sign a warrant on these people for disorderly conduct where they continue to harass them for giving them money. All they got to do is give us a call and we'll answer it and come out and if they'll sign a complaint, then we'll take care of it. Both Alabama State and their opponent, Central State of Ohio, went through a brief workout this afternoon in preparation for tomorrow's clash in Crampton Bowl. The kickoff for the game is set for 1.30. The Hornets are 7-3 on the season, their last game being a win over Tuskegee on Thanksgiving Day here in Montgomery. Alabama State coach George James says his team wants to finish the season with a win, and he says he doesn't think the Hornets will have any trouble getting ready mentally for the game, despite the fact that Central State has only won two games this season. Central State has had a tough schedule this year, however. Five of their eight losses have been to nationally ranked teams. Tomorrow's contest will be billed the Frank Bannister Classic, named after the nationally prominent sportscaster. The game also gives Alabama State and Central State two of the longest regular season schedules in the nation. Both schools open their 1978 campaign back on September 2nd. James Spann, WSFA TV Sports. Alabama Power Company President Joseph Farley has announced some utility company cutbacks. Farley says that due to their not receiving a rate hike increase, they're having to make some drastic cutbacks in cash outflow. Farley says the cutbacks will come in the forms of halted construction, which ultimately means worker layoffs. The decision of the Public Service Commission on November 22nd, though late, gave the company a measure of increased revenue which would have sustained a proper level of service and made possible borrowing for needed construction, even though the order contained a number of burdensome and unworkable conditions. However, the restraining order of November 28th by the Montgomery Circuit Court and the immediate reduction in rates which followed have strained the company's financial posture beyond the bounds of prudence. We therefore are forced to instruct company management to begin immediate cutbacks in construction projects and layoffs of both company operating and office personnel and construction personnel. That is the official statement of the Board of Directors. We wish to make it clear that this action today is not directed at any court which has under consideration the legal question surrounding the rate increase granted by the Public Service Commission. The company proved its need for the increase at the Public Service Commission and in protracted hearings, lasting over a year and a half, often delayed by the governor through his attorney. We finally received the increase long past the time of its need. Now the loss of the increase through legal maneuvering of the governor and the attorney general leaves us no choice but to reduce outflow of cash until this unfortunate situation can be decided in the courts. Nearly 800 workers are expected to be laid off during the first week of this cutback, which began with the layoff of some tree cutters. The layoffs will later reach into other areas of the giant utility until nearly 4,000 people are laid off. 
McFarley does say, however, that efforts are being made to avoid these cutbacks. One such effort is the curtailed purchases of coal. Farley says they're making due with what they've got stockpiled. Secondly, Farley says although this announcement is not aimed at court officials now litigating a PSC-approved rate increase, he hopes the November 22nd increase will ultimately be approved. On top of that, Farley says the board has approved the filing of yet another increase request should the one in court die. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News in Birmingham. Downtown Unlimited, along with the Chamber of Commerce, Keep Montgomery Beautiful, the city school, senior citizens, and others are participating in a project of making useful and attractive articles from throwaway items. These women at Richardson Terrace are but a few of the number making Christmas decorations during the Christmas season. Senior citizens who live here will decorate a large tree with recycled ornaments and hold their annual tree lighting ceremony next week. In festivities tomorrow, through the project Litter into Glitter, a Christmas tree will be presented to prisoners at the county jail. Brownie Scouts are making ornaments out of litter for what's called a wee tree in front of Union Station. The Litter into Glitter project is being offered as a pilot program to the National Council of Garden Clubs by one of the individuals who spearheaded the project here in Montgomery. This year, we chose recycling for beautification also to prove Alabama in particular and everyone's ability when properly motivated to be creative and to use basic skills and to have something beautiful to begin man's innate search for beauty on this earth. So is this project the glitter from litter the project yes. that you're going to introduce? Yes it is and it, it will involve more than 5,000 uh, boys and girls and elderly people up to the age of 90 years. Tell me a little bit about the recycling process. What sort of materials are people using? In some places, the, in the school children are picking up uh, things that are usually put in the trash cans, milk cartons, uh, drink, orange juice um, things, and uh, our elderly people have foster grandchildren from the high schools and they bring them things from, uh, uh, well, we'll say the hamburger stands where they have French fries, they save old Christmas cards, they use coat hangers and foil to make kissing bells and uh, various ways like that. Each person sets out to take something that is usually put in the trash and create something that may be used in a nursing home or on his own front door. And this also saves money? This saves a great deal of money, but there's something better than that. I, busy hands that are doing good will never be young hands doing bad things. One of the reasons given for centering the fruits of the project in the downtown area was the anticipation of drawing people there to see the handiwork. Cal Swartz of Klein & Son Jewelers explained the significance of this project to the downtown area. Spotlights downtown. It also allows Montgomery to spotlight and complement the various schools, the ed elderly, the incapacitated, and other groups that have participated in making uh, glitter from litter, and that's the name of this particular project. Now, it brings people downtown to show in various uh, windows and various showcases uh, those items that these various groups and these various people have made out of um, actually just material that is uh, of no value. 
you will see uh, tin cans that are made into beautiful Christmas ornaments. Uh, you will see uh, all the various uh, glitter that's made from litter and from recycled materials. And that's what we uh, feel that we want to be a part of in this particular thing and to attract people downtown. And I'm saying this as a merchant. The litter and the glitter decorations on the large Christmas tree next to the fountain in Court Square were all made by Montgomery school children. One interesting decoration shaped like a Christmas tree was made simply by saving little plastic containers french fries come in, attaching them together with yarn, and pasting in pictures from Christmas cards. This one's made from pie tins cut with scissors and curled into shape. Tin cans also have been cut with shears into different shapes and used for ornaments on the tree. Each high school in Montgomery, as well as Doja Elementary, Girl Scouts, and Parks and Recreation have selected a window at a vacant building in downtown Montgomery. They've used recycled materials for the Christmas decorations and gifts that are on display there. The recycled Christmas decorations and gifts in the Litter into Glitter project will be judged for awards the week before Christmas. And the ones that are then dismantled will go to nursing homes for Christmas presents. Well, the purpose of Hospital Appreciation Week, Ivy, is threefold. One is to say thank you to the many, many people who work in our hospital care facilities. Technicians, physicians, administrators, secretaries, you just go on and on and on. And the other second part is to educate the public and ourselves on what's available in Montgomery, what type health care facilities we have here, uh, what do we need, um, just an educational thing for the general public. And the third thing is we want to get the public involved. We would like to see more young people go into the health care programs uh, in whatever field they feel interested, and we'd like to encourage volunteerism in the hospitals. And in doing the involvement part of it, we're asking people to participate by coming to the open houses at the various hospitals on Saturday, December the 9th from 1.30 to 3.30. Each of the hospitals, with the exception of Maxwell, which is federal, will participate in the program. Mr. Copeland, University Medical Center has been here for about a year now. What function does it serve in the community? We have 75 beds. We are a general acute care medical facility. Uh, as far as specializing in any one type of uh, medicine, I cannot say that we do. We are a general facility, as I said. Uh, some of the programs, some of the services we offer to the public who do use the hospital are outpatient surgery. We have a special area within the hospital which is designed to handle the patient who needs surgery performed but who does not have to, uh, as it were, be hospitalized overnight. They come in, they are operated on, and they go home the same day. This is a separate section within the hospital. We are the only hospital in the city that has that, that uh, type of design. Uh, I must say that it is a very highly utilized uh, function that we do serve. Uh, another important thing I'd like to mention is the concept of nursing care, which is uh, here at UMC. When the hospital was founded, the philosophy was to give a, a new level of care, something different than which had existed in the city up until this time. Uh, what evolved out of that is primary nursing, whereby the patient comes into the hospital, they have contact with as much as possible the same nurse during their stay. Obviously the nurse has to have a couple of days off, but instead of Sally and Janie and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, taking care of that single patient, there is a one-to-one -one relationship so that the nurse gets to know, know the patient, the patient gets to know the nurse. It provides for a continuity of care. It provides for a much higher level of expertise than you can accomplish uh, by having sort of a helter-skelter approach, which is more or less the, tra the, uh, the traditional way to handle it. Uh, there are some other little touches we have. Uh, we let patients choose from a menu that has 14 entrees. It's like going to a, to a restaurant. They can have wine. We have color 
accent walls in the patient rooms. We have free television. We have free telephone. We're trying to put all these things, uh, some major, as I mentioned, the, the nursing care, uh, some you might say are minor, like the things I mentioned after that, but you put all of them together into a package and you offer that to a patient. And you come out with a patient who leaves the hospital hopefully healthy. We do everything we possibly can from that point of view. But a patient who leaves the hospital happy, or at least happier than they would if they left, say, maybe another hospital. Uh, we try to make it as much as uh, home-like as we possibly can. How do your prices compare with the prices at other hospitals? We are competitive with the prices in the area. We are not necessarily more expensive, nor are we necessarily a lot less expensive. Taking a comprehensive look at the city of Montgomery, would you say that the health care that's available in the city is adequate? You can attack that. I, I can attack the answer to that from maybe several points of view, but I'll try to be brief. I think the health care in the city, uh, as far as the, uh, the number of physicians, the number of people giving health care, uh, without doing a lot of research on it, I'd say it's probably adequate. Uh, as far as the facilities are concerned, I think Montgomery has to face uh, the future and see if there will be enough beds, enough uh, medical facilities to face the population growth that is confronting the city right now, especially the shift in population. Sir Robert, what is the Australian view of the Camp David Accords? Most Australians, in fact anybody that I met, were very thrilled indeed that the United States should have, through its president, asserted its world leadership situation in such a way. It was a remarkable performance. Is there a feeling, I know a, a lot of the immigration into Australia is from the Middle Eastern countries, is there a a sense of feeling from them, uh, of relief perhaps? I should imagine you know, in that so. Community. All I would have had back from Australia since it happened mm -hmm. was compliments, great happiness, and a recognition that the US was once again taking what I call the world moral leadership position. What is uh, your point of view towards the economic situation in the world right now? Is the American dollar is probably at an all-time low as an international exchange mm -hmm. medium. What kind of an effect does this have in Australia? Well, it doesn't have a very great effect on Australia. We have managed our currency in a different way. We relate our management of the currency to very small changes up or down in relation to the comparative value of our trading partners. Therefore, the United States dollar, the yen, the Deutsche Mark, the British pound, all take into calculation when we're doing this. So in the balance of it, we have a management mm -hmm. scene. We haven't followed your dollar down, we didn't follow it up. From our point of view, it hasn't really been a marked effect on us. It has had a, some effect on individual exporters who wrote their contracts in US dollars. But that's in the general management of a world currency scene. You take your gains, you take your losses. You're pretty much uh, immune from the ups and downs of the oil uh, crises that some of other <laughs> nations are not, like the United States. What would happen? Uh, what position would you be put in if there were, an, a, say, an Arab oil boycott against the United States? Would the United States come to Australia for oil, or would you export it? I would think the United States would be regarded by Australia as amongst its top friends and allies, and you would do everything you could to help them. Now, our situation in the Australian scene is that we are about 80 percent now self-sufficient until about the year 1986-87. We are remarkably strong in surplus of gas, mm -hmm. very strong indeed, we have an, an immense amount. We have a great, great coal reserve and energy source. In fact, in an energy sense, if you evaluate Australia, by the middle of the 1980s, it looks like one of the potentially wealthy countries of the world in total energy availability. Some of that is hard to export. Now, 
in the United States context of wanting help from Australia, Australia has always been willing to try what it could, to do what it could to try to help. Yeah. We have building what seems, at least from what we find in this country, a tremendous problem in Africa. Uh, what is Australia's point of view on what's going on there? I'm disturbed about people who are involving themselves there from outside in the affairs of those people. Some of the people I know well. Australia is very strongly against apartheid, and we would make that known. But we would hope that the African peoples could be persuaded by wise help from outside to work together to solve problems rather than to not knock each other over to do so. But we regard it as a very tricky and difficult thing. But it can't David help kind of meeting help in some of the difficulties, particularly in, in South Africa? Is it, is it at a point where talking would do any good? I don't know enough to say so, but a Camp David can work when someone is willing to try and someone is willing to be invited. Now, who would be willing to try in the African continent? And who would come to the party if asked? These are questions that really I should ask you, because I frankly don't know. But I'm sure of one thing, the world at large can do without a war, thank you very much. So what should we all do about trying to overcome this? The Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and unto his saints. But let them not return again unto folly. And I would like to say, as a Christian, to these two friends of mine, the words of Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the children of God. And so to an enthusiastic audience, as an enthusiastic audience,